So, so we've got Cuomo uh, taking money. We've got, uh, and he doesn't, it's not, people think when they take money, because oh, he's going to live high on the hog, but he's already living high on the hog. So right. that's not, it's, it's, it's just for power to. Well, you know, the selfish pursuit of power is what politicians, most politicians are about. And you see that flagrantly in the case of Andrew Cuomo um, with um, Bill de Blasio, with many other politicians, both Democrats and Republicans. And they will do anything uh, in pursuit of that power. Um, you, there's a whole history going back you know, 200 years in this country uh, where you see politicians, uh, some of whom fortunately are finally held accountable um, who are prosecuted and convicted, but others who engage in forms of corruption that are perhaps subtler and that are perhaps just barely within the bounds of the legal. And our system, unfortunately, um, has too few mechanisms for accountability. I think ultimately the responsibility lies with us. It, uh, re uh, it really rests with and depends on an informed and engaged public. But you have this vicious cycle because citizens are so turned off by this disgusting display of corruption and selfish pursuit of power that they tune out, uh, don't follow politics and policy closely. Um, or if they do at all, they do through a lens of uh, superficial identity politics. Um, so there's a relatively small number of people who follow politics and policy closely in this city, in this state, in this country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of them, at least half of them are right-wing Republicans who are pursuing a policy agenda that is really injurious to uh, the, uh, the common welfare of the country. So basically, in my estimate, I mean, this is a complete... Uh, estimate, but I think there are probably 10% of the American public who not only follow politics and policy very closely, but are committed to progressive principles. And it is extremely difficult to uh, advance a progressive policy agenda with only 10% of the public uh, in active support of it. So people need to get engaged. They need to articulate and enforce an ethic of responsibility and accountability. We need to hold candidates, politicians, elected officials, appointed officials accountable for their actions. And that starts with every single one of us. And it's a hard thing to do because the mainstream media, frankly, are in the infotainment business. It's a little bit of information larded with a whole lot of entertainment and with uh, commercials. I mean. The, 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 the nightly news segment on the networks. Uh, it's half an hour, but it's actually 17 minutes if you take out the commercials. And when you take out the, you know, the, the fuzzy kind of, the warm, fuzzy human interest stories and the entertainment-related stuff, you have maybe five to seven minutes of hard news. And even that hard news is really softened by the fact that you have commercial underwriters, you have it's supported by commercial enterprises, right? So if Walmart or Amazon or Monsanto are among your advertisers, are you really going to do heavy-duty, hard-hitting investigative reporting on Walmart, Monsanto, or Amazon? Probably it, it, not. it doesn't even seem to matter some even with the health care debate. Um, for a long time, it's clear that the, 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 the stats on people when they, when they poll them uh, they want this health care. And, yes. and, and the same people, will, the, the newscasters will say it's not politically feasible. It's not politically feasible because people in power who are like reshaping the world in some image that they, you know, aside from the money they're, you know, how high on the hog they're living, they don't want it. Right. But the rest of us want it. <laughs> so, and, 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 the, and the newscaster is... is, is on the left, on the left, there is no left in the, in the mainstream. <laughs> There's no uh, left, left. But I mean, you know, if you think about health care, who controls the health care industry? Who co controls access to health care? It's the insurance industry. And although the Affordable Care Act had a few good things in it, such as uh, prohibiting discrimination based on pre-existing conditions, what it really did, Obamacare actually made the health 
insurance industry even more central to the provision of health care and the denial of health care. So uh, the reality is there's only one way to get to universal health care, which is through a single-payer government-run system, such as Medicare for All. I'm delighted to hear that Bernie Sanders just introduced a bill in Congress to that effect. I just came back from Europe. Uh, I was talking about various health care issues with friends in Norway, and they were absolutely shocked at the um, stupidity of our system, the cruelty of our system, where people are basically bankrupted for um, health care issues that in a system like Norway's or France's uh, would be pretty easily taken care of. Uh, there's only one way uh, to universal health care, and that is through a single-payer government-run system. Yes, certainly, certainly. And the, the, the issue of the cruelty of the American uh, uh, way of looking at each other, you know, maybe the Europeans saw how cruel they could really be as they came out of World War II, how nasty they could be to World War I and World War II. And the, the Americans didn't have to then fight that on, on, on American territory. Uh, so they, well, America has such a long way to go, so much power and such a long way right. to go. Right, and we, we now have a neoliberal economy, which is a rapacious form of capitalism that is relatively new. It's really about 30, 40 years old. And uh, it's sort of like capitalism on steroids. Um, and uh, it really relies on the fact that there's a free uh, mobility of capital flows, but not of labor. And there's a huge internal contradiction there. And that is actually at the nexus, the crux of our immigration problems in this country, the fact that we have free flow of capital across national boundaries, but no free flow of labor, which is actually a contradiction if you think even in terms of neoclassical economics. Uh, so it's something that we need to examine, but something that rarely gets discussed in any um, analytic uh, manner. Yes, because it's it's really the the fix is in and, and again and uh, it's what uh, we we just have we're, we're almost at the end here. But if you could if you could just how has capitalism affected uh, human potential? Oh gosh! Uh, <laughs> in the next thirty seconds, um, that is an enormous question. I mean, I think capitalism is a very effective system for accelerating the formation of capital, but it is also an incredibly inefficient system for harnessing human potential. And uh, I think that's something that we need to examine. I've written a little bit about this and about these other issues on PaulinePark.com. You could go to my website and look at some of my writings. Uh, but I think it's really worth examining uh, in greater detail.